Hello. Hopefully everybody can hear me on, online. Um, if somebody can give me a thumbs up or let me know, that'd be great. Brilliant. Okay. So here we are. So hello, everybody. Welcome. So I do have notes, so I'm not very good at presenting. So um, for everybody who don't, doesn't know who I am, um, I'm Amy, and um, I'm pleased to host you here at the Bar Tribunal and Adjudications um, Service, which is also known as BTAS. Um, but I'm actually part of the ICCA, which is um, the Inns of Court College of Advocacy. Um, and together with BTAS, we are under the Council of the Inns of Court umbrella. Um, so uh, BTAS has, is hosting us today, but this isn't actually where we're based. We're, we're actually based on Chancery Lane. Um, I am the Head of Online Learning at the Inns of Court. And um, for those of you who don't know what we do, um, we launched our bar course in 2020, and the bar course is a postgraduate qualification for those uh, who want to practice as barristers. So I'm very fortunate that our course portfolio is, um, but at the same time, there's a lot, you know, it's very high pressure. We've got a lot on to deliver a, to deliver our course for our students. Um, so before we get started with the presentations, I just wanted to quickly say uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. So um, there is not no fire alarm should be going off but if it does it obviously means we do have to get out of the building um for those of you who were here this morning i actually uh, it was the wrong directions to the to get out of here so um if it does go off you just come out of the same way you came in and then just follow me and we'll go into the square i think our meeting point is number three um but hopefully um that won't happen um toilets and things hopefully you all found them they're just outside the street down the corridor um and this session will be recorded um and sent to the AMT later um so it will be on youtube but if anybody has any problems with that please come and, and see me directly or, or drop me an email after the session um here is the schedule for today um and so we are due to finish a little bit earlier um and julie is going to be doing a presentation as well um because we had to swap a speaker uh, uh, over, uh, but we're due to finish about 4.30, but we'll see how things go. Uh, there is another group, um, part of BTAS, who is due to um, need to use this room at five. Um, so I don't imagine it's gonna carry on past that, but we'll see how we go. I think if we don't have any questions, I think it's, over to you. Yeah. So, are you happy to use my? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, your slides, well, I just copy them. Thank so you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and hope you had a good, nice lunch and uh, you're in the process of digesting. <laughs> uh, my name is Giacomo Occupinti, and I work at the University of the Arts, uh, London College of Fashion. And, Today, I wanted to talk to you about uh, how we uh, introduced video-based pedagogy, so the, the, the journey that we went on from the conception to using them, using videos as part of uh, mainly, today I'll talk about uh, fully online master's degrees. So uh, let me start. So the background story to this, so this with where this project started is that after the pandemic, uh, a working group had been established to set up a response to this report, the Emerging Pedagogist Evaluation Report. And part of that report was to create some guidelines for the whole uh, college around pre-recorded videos, principles, and guidelines. So in October 21, we produced this report with some recommendation based on best practices. And um, in May 22, this report is used as a base for Staff development in online and maybe the production. Okay, so this is how we got to this point. Uh, and the report tried to address three main themes when we, uh, with regards to you know, videos. Uh, one is how to scaffold video in the learning journey. So, what's the function of the video in the online lesson? And oh, sorry, the second part was how to create engaging videos, which is quite a wide. Uh, um, category so 
we focused on the sort of baseline quality of the video and if there's a length that's recommended. And we're not going to talk about this too much today, but we, we also looked at principle around distinct type of videos. So the difference between a lecture versus a tutorial versus a how-to or a step-to-step -step guideline or versus a recording of a discussion. And finally, how to uh, set up a video production support. So how do we help you know, our lecturers produce videos? So the first thing that we looked at is how to scaffold the video into the learning journey. And we started from ABC, you're probably very familiar to this. And uh, we started from the assumption that obviously uh, a video is falls in the acquisition learning type. So it's, it's usually a resource which you uh, uh, watch being a video. And learning, learning through acquisition is what learners are doing when they are listening to a podcast or you're listening to me now. So hopefully you are acquiring <laughs> uh, or watching a demo or a video. And there are also other learning types as part of this model. Um, so this is kind of a, I apologize, it's quite a, a short image, but this is a, a typical week in the online master. So as we designed it and to show you how we, we've planned it, you have at the top this active engagement uh, question for the week. This is, is, is uh, designed to center the, the, the student's attention on a big question for the week. Then you have the sort of acquisition part. You have some readings, a podcast to listen, or a video to watch. Uh, then you have a practice and discussion section. So usually it's a question regarding the preparation resources. And the part which uh, we use for um, um, where we house the, the videos, which I'm going to show you, or the, the, the principles that we use, it's in this online Moodle lesson. So this is where we use the pre-recorded videos that we produce. And finally, in the week, there's the seminar. Okay, So this is the every week it works like this. There's a preparation, there's a pre-record to watch, and then there's a live seminar. So when we uh, created this, uh, we call it a live lesson, middle lesson, we used principles and strategies. So the three principles that we used was to give student control over the lesson, so how they moved around the videos. Uh, we wanted to manage cognitive loads, so the amount of information they have to deal at any given time, and also promote active learning within the lesson. And to do that, we used navigation menu to give student control. We tried to manage the, the length and chunks of video to manage the load and to promote active learning we added quizzes and activities in within the the lesson so this is a screenshot of the, the middle lesson so on the left hand side you have where the media is presented so the video on the right hand side is the lesson menu so this is it gives the student the ability to jump through the the lesson uh, they can go in a sequence or they can skip in various chunk. The only thing I can, I'll show you the menu in this a little bit uh, more later. It's not, uh, we can do some work on the, the visual part of the, of the menu. Uh, this is an example of an activity. So we embed uh, H5P for those of you, I'm sure you know uh, what it is. Uh, so in, in between videos, you have activities or other examples of activities are tablets. So if you look at the menu on, uh, on its own, I try to sort of single out these are the videos <laughs> and these are the activities. So we're trying to interleave video activity with activity in a sequence. Okay, so that's how we create the structure. So, but going back to that report which I was talking to you about at the beginning, how do you try and create videos which are effective and engaging? Um, you have two main things. We, we thought we consider two, two main things. The pedagogy, so then what is the video used for and what's the actual function of the video? And since we are uh, a um, creative institution, we have filmmakers, we engage with the, the filmmaking uh, departments. Because obviously when they create videos, they use, we realize some of the same principles that are used in the production of videos for education as part of making films. So there are, there's quite a lot of overlap. Uh, as one uh, academic said, the video needs to make sense and look and sound good. Which I thought it was a good catchphrase. If it makes sense and it looks and sound good, it's a good video. Uh, so when we 
looked at the pedagogical aspect first. So uh, as I mentioned before, we looked at the cognitive load, which is, uh, again, the amount of information that the student is presented at any given time at that process. Uh, we looked at, at the elements that we can uh, use to affect the engagement in the video. So we have uh, promoting attention to the video and the elements that promote active learning. So the activities that you easily in between all those chunks. So for those of you who are not familiar with cognitive load theory, what we try to basically uh, work with is this, this part, working memory. So you have a visual channel, which is what you see, an auditory channel, and you can overload those with too much information. For example, when you have slides like this one, probably, where there's a lot of you know text, a lot of uh, boxes, and it's hard for you to sort of make sense of all this information. So we, you, there are things that you can do to sort of uh, help the students uh, uh, guide um, sort of guide the attention of the students. One of these things is signaling. So I'm now trying to get your attention to go there by using visual cues. So signaling, it's cueing also. It's the use of on-screen text or symbols to highlight important information. So by doing, if I can go back, by doing this, hopefully your eyes will go there automatically. The second uh, strategy you can use to reduce cognitive load is uh, segmenting or chunking. So rather than have big 15, maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes videos or an hour or two hours videos, you can chunk them into manageable loads. Okay, and again, this is the um, definition of chunking, which again, it's, it's something that, you know, we see all the time in uh, other things. For example, if I show you uh, this number and ask you to remember it or memorize it, it's quite, probably quite complex. But if I show you the same number like this, it's probably easier and it's, you, know, you probably recognize it as a phone number. I mean, the O2O gave it away, but you know, we chunk information in manageable bits. And the last one is weeding, which is the elimination of interesting but extraneous information from the video. That is information that does not contribute to the learning goal. I don't know if you've seen videos with lots of nice music background, lots of animation that actually distracts from what it is that you're trying to do, which is a lesson. So, for example, this is very interesting information, very beautiful, but as you can see, it is actually distracted from the text and the slide. So. Uh, then, looking at the elements that affects engagement, uh, we looked at this study, which seems to be the the facto, um, uh, the most cited study I've seen on, on uh, video lengths. Uh, this is based on uh, edX um, data, so I think it's about uh, seven point seven million viewing uh, sessions, and it seems that you know the length. <laughs> The optimal length is between six and nine minutes. Anything above six minutes, you get a drop in engagement, which is quite steep. So if you can, you know, keeping the, the video length to within the six to nine minutes will give you, you know, will enhance the, the, the chance that the student will actually go through with, with the whole um, section. Uh, other things that you can do is, is use a conversational style. So when you speak, try and be, you know, uh, not use language which is too complex or uh, it's quite um, you know, inaccessible. So try and, and uh, again, be conversational. Again, other things is to speak relatively with, with enthusiasm. I know it's, it's quite, I mean, enthusiasm is, is a word which is could mean different things, but you know, look enthusiastic and this is not always possible because sometimes we have to reuse uh, videos for multiple lessons. But if the students feel that this video has been made for this student in this class specifically, it, they will connect more with, uh, with the lesson. Uh, the third element was to promote active learning. So as you remember before, I showed you the menu with the videos and the activities. And what you can do is use guiding questions. So before you use uh, watching the video, you can ask the students to look for particular things or try and reflect on something so that it guides their attention. Uh, you can use interactive features that give student control. Again, we have the menu, we have uh, some of the activities there. And you can integrate questions into the video so you can break the video with activities rather in video. So, if some of you, we use Phenopto, but I'm 
I'm sure other platforms are available. You can add questions in the video to add some checkpoints. And you can make the video part of a larger assignment or homework assignment, or make the video part of the discussion that will be held in the seminar in the week. So again, you're linking the, the video with other elements of that week. Um, now, that was the pedagogy part. Now, let's look at the, the filmmaking. So how, how to make these videos. And when um, talking to our uh, filmmakers at UAL, good audio is more important than good video. That was, they say. So if you can choose between one, go for audio rather than video. It's better to have something that looks likely worse, but sounds good than the opposite. Because again, try and go, I think I realized this by using YouTube a lot. If you see a video that's where the audio is poor, I'm more likely to just not go through it. If it's if, if the audio is good and the visual is not that bad, I can see you can understand. But again, test it for yourself. Uh, the importance of lighting, and again, you don't have you need to have a good lighting rig, but uh, we have loads of examples where lectures were filming themselves like this, so with the windows behind them, so the face is completely uh, you know, dark or with weird reflections. So help them understand that no, it's a basic setup, like use a neutral background, um, use a face, a, a light that's directly on their face. And again, keep it short, six to nine minutes. Uh, show your face. That is something that we had, uh, you know, various uh, comments in that. We, some people like to show their face, some people don't like to show their face. What we tend to advise people sometimes is to, uh, if they can, edit the moments where they show their face rather than the slides, because you know, we, we tend to have faces slide next to each other. But if you don't advance that, you don't need to show the slide. Again, for cognitive load, you can say from this minute to this minute, I want just to my face to be visible. So the attention of the student is on what you say and not the slide. So through filmmaking, through editing, you can basically direct the attention of the student to, to you. Uh, now, I've got some data from um, uh, the NASFM online, so Strategic Partial Marketing Online for this year. So it was just finished the first year and I've collected what happened. So there isn't, there's no analysis here. I'm just showing you what uh, we've been creating in the first year. Uh, so the average length of the video is 16 minutes. So we're a bit off the sort of uh, recommended uh, uh, six to nine. But again, we're not that far off. So we think it's, it's as, a, as a first try, it's um, we've done pretty well. Uh, in a week, you get uh, an average of one hour of video, which is meant to uh, represent a, an hour and a half to two hours lecture. So again, even here, we, I think we're doing relatively well, considering that you know, at the beginning we had instances of a two hour lecture turning into a two hour video. Now we're fine with that. So, and again, these are averages. We, we are still examples of one hour and 45 as well. But on average, uh, so we produced a number of 340 videos for NMA online. That's uh, six units, 12 weeks per unit. Uh, that's the number of activities created. And on average, each lesson is divided into four chunks. And we have an average of two activities per lesson. So again, it looks like uh, the numbers are pretty positive. So you have four chunks of video and two activities interleaved. Uh, in terms of video production support, we again, we identified two types of support again. One is the set of support, which we, uh, we can give through um, uh, learn technology support, um, which is how to use the tools. So the, one of the barriers is to be able to use the cameras, the microphones, the lighting rig, um, and how to the file management and distribution. So a lot of the times, you know, lectures would record at home with Panopto and then put the file in their own folder where we can't access it. So all these things need to be explained. And this is the part where we work more is the sort of creative pedagogical support, which is how to actually plan the videos. So how to prepare a video concept, how to map the video to the learning outcomes, the image composition, the camera positioning, the ease of images with talking head, the editing techniques, the tone of voice, 
which as you can see, I put them here, is like something like image composition and camera positioning comes from the filmmaking language. But again, image composition translated to what are you showing at any given time as a pedagogical uh, effect because it basically determines what their attention is directed to. So, and I think, uh, you can skip that. So this is the recap of what we talked about in that report. And let's see, I want to turn to some questions. Because, <laughs> uh, There's somebody on the chat who's asked a question as well. So. Oh, okay. So I'm sharing oh, this. Anora has asked, how did you decide which content to make into video and which to have more aesthetic media? Okay. I don't, I don't understand. This. So what, why why did you choose you chose some to be videos and some yeah. to be more static? Why why how did you decide between the two? Well this that's usually the, the lecturer. We we don't decide uh, you know what type of content. Does you mean within within the actual videos or on the, on the middle page? On the middle page. Okay. Uh, uh, usually, the the pre-recorded lecture is is a video with some activity, and anything else is by static content. I think in the maybe in readings yes. or yeah yeah that would be the preparation for the lectures, um, but also in the preparation we have uh, the podcast and videos. So maybe I think static. Mm -hmm. Probably not. No. But yeah, that just came through on the chat. Yeah. The same I don't know if anybody knows how to change the display on here because I think I can only show this, <laughs> this or that on this screen. So unless we just carry, unless we just happy to carry on as we are, it just yeah. means the people online will see this screen instead. I think the best yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, we just analyzed the, 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 the data and students are, are happy with uh, the, the, the general structure. One thing that uh, we are reviewing is the amount of preparation work for the pre-recorded lecture because, again, we, it's a reflection we're just having now. We've noticed that although this, it's an online lesson, it's built on the preconception of the face-to-face -face, as in you prepare something to then watch the video, which is the lecture, to then do a reflection where we could try things next year to, to basically move it to, into the same lesson, because you don't need to prepare potentially for a lecture. It's not a lecture anymore, it's an online lesson, so you can change kind of the intro video. Exactly, yeah, yeah, or not. Yeah. But the students, I think, they, they enjoyed the, the activities and the reflection. Excellent, so interesting work for uh, Just wondered a little bit about H or P. So there are lots of different activity types of what's count now, 30, 35, 5. Yeah. I wondered which types did you uh, use most often? Yeah. And did they take a lot of time to develop? And also, did they get good engagement? Was it linked up to your great work, for example, where you're able to track engagement yeah. with interactive H type versus H? Video content. Yeah, no, we didn't the great book. We, we checked the responses. I mean, and it, it was, was quite a small cohort. So, you know, we got 100% engagement with most of them. I mean, I have a, a spreadsheet which I, I can show you later on with. I've tracked all the activities one by one and the types. The most used one is uh, multiple choice because it's, it's easy to, to build and it's self marking. Uh, some that we are uh, used that are quite interesting is the one I showed you, which is the paragraph. So you basically break the paragraph into uh, different parts and scramble and ask the students to put them in order. Uh, we also use the drag and drop quite heavily. Production, it depends, you know, we, we tend to do it for the lecture. So they prepare the, the activity usually on a slide and then for, um, um, which is created for them. Yeah, I mean, once you know how, how to do it, it's not that long, but you need to understand the. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. Really interesting. One of the things we've found in working with academics that are perhaps more used to standing in front of a, a live audience and presenting as they're 
teaching performance is that they struggle to translate that to performing to a camera yeah. as opposed to performing to a physical audience. Yeah. Is that something that you've encountered or have you found any ways to, to deal with? Yeah, we have. I uh, mean, one thing I can say is highly personal, depends on the different characters of the entertainment. But we also had, which I haven't mentioned here, we had studio to record. So for people that were less confident with by themselves, they could go into a studio with a technician. And in a way, they were kind of presenting to to them. So it was kind of like presenting not to an audience, but to some sort of live. Uh, people, I think, in terms of supporting them, um, we just uh, want to explain to them that, uh, that they don't have to do this in one go, that they can find more that we can help them you know, uh, manage the, the deliver of that lecture in smaller bits. And uh, it, it's, it's okay not to, not to feel uncomfortable at the beginning. And uh, um, we had one uh, lecturer who um, and the, the, she gave on her own performance was very different from what everyone else thought about her performance. We thought it was a great lesson, and she thought it was a bit too robotic. And we thought, oh, actually, it's very to the point, it looked professional, but you know, from her point of view, it, was, it wasn't a good delivery. So it's interesting to see how you know, your perception of what you think is good can vary from more other things. So, but yeah, I don't know, I think the answer to your question is give them possibly the, the chance of recording in a studio or to go through um, the uh, initial recording with uh, learning technologist or additional learning designer. And um, I'll find your question. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> related to that, how long did you allow to, to create all this? Because I know sometimes the activists can be perfectionists and want to a long time to create one short video. Did you have enough time to? Uh, for how long do you mean? How, how, like, like, how many months? What was your time frame? Oh, okay. 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 Hey, okay. It was quite. Uh, mm -hmm. This was quite a quick turnaround. We asked them to to give us the videos at least three weeks before they went mentally going on. So we had time to edit and this is, uh, uh, it was quite short. It was, uh, very short turnaround, and I think preparation time they had for this was three hours for a 90 minutes uh, um, learning lesson. Learning I think the, 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 the biggest problem we had was to try and you know, um, convince them that a 90 minute lesson doesn't necessarily have to be 90 minutes of video because <laughs> is this. I think we still we still all probably put value in them talking and then face being the only currency that you know equates to a lesson or teaching as opposed to you know planning an online lesson which might be into a three-minute video, then you write an activity which is in a written document, and then you do another three minutes video, and then you do and write something else. So when the student does go through, they you know eventually end up using an hour and a half, but there isn't an hour and a half of you talking to them. And that's that's the bit of a, the, the hurdle, the hurdle. I uh, add something to that as well. It's, it's to deal with the staff who are presented with a, a timetabled event in a physical space. Yeah. They'll often need to fill what they talk about to expand the space. Yeah. Whereas with video, it's almost the opposite way around. Yeah. But it can attract what they talk about. Yeah. It might be the same set of slides. Yeah. But you fill it to bit 90 minutes and then you contract it a bit nine minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I think you have the um, one of the things that we get is that you know, the, uh, I want to be able to be more conversational and just, you know, to be more natural. I say, yeah, yes, I understand why you, you want to do that. But, you know, if, if they add minutes to a video, that, you know, you might not translate in a good video. You know, as if you are very good at being conversational, I will mean do it. You know, it's, I think it's around the sign of you know being short, short, and to the point because students, you know, will appreciate that. Okay, test for yourself when you go on YouTube and you see a twenty-minute video. What, what's what's the feeling that you have at seeing that number as opposed to when you see a four-minute video? It's you know, it, it, it's I mean, personally, I'm going to hit you again. I haven't watched this. 
and it's not going to be a big investment of energy when you see 25 to sit down to be ready and if you have to be attentive for that time but again if if um if you're comfortable doing long long form then you can do that as well we do we are running over oh, just sorry. quite some quite a bit so we do have to start wrapping it up is it, a, is it a quick one yeah. yeah thank you very much okay thank you, thank you. Right. Sorry? Was it not a film? I thought it was me next. Yeah, you go. <laughs> Maybe I got my slides mixed up. If anybody is techie and can fix this, because obviously we're seeing this, but the people online are seeing presenter mode. So uh, if anybody knows of a way to actually <laughs> do it so it doesn't show it, then uh, I would appreciate some somebody taking a look. But if not, we'll just have to carry on as we are. In, in PowerPoint, there's a bit that says don't use presenter. Yeah. In um, slideshow, go to slideshow. At the top, top bar, sorry. At the bar at the top, there's a slideshow. Yep. Yeah. And then there's something about on the right, right of it, says use presenter view there. Yeah, and so you can you just up, it's yeah, ticket, so untick it. Okay, let's try that, that then. Might. And then let me see where. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I I mixed up the slides. So it's it's up to would Adele like to go? Are you ready to go next? Yeah. yeah. Let's see if then this works. Hopefully. Ah, hooray. Okay. So uh resume the show. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Learned something as well. Eh? <laughs> <That's> brilliant. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, I'm Adele Cushing. Um, I work at Birkbeck University of London. Um, I've been in post since uh, February 2020 in the uh, digital education team. Um, so we've spent quite a lot of uh, the last few years um, building up a teaching model, blended learning teaching model, um, with uh, you know a, a, a template design in Moodle, three pot, three pot model. Um, and a mix of uh, remote uh, and in-person learning, which um, over the last uh, year or so has gradually developed into a more official kind of hybrid type model of learning, which has been um, really driven by our academics uh, in terms of supporting the needs of our students who are mostly uh, working Londoners, needing the flexibility, uh, well, Working Londoners and anyone else really is working on these sort of flexibility of learning at uh, different uh, stages of life um, and thinking about how we can facilitate kind of post pandemic, the change in commuter patterns, um, the change in the number of people who are, are in London uh, during the day, um, whether they might come to our campus to study in the evening or whether they might um, be at home or on holiday and how they can still engage with our learning. So, uh, as I say, that this uh, project um, has come about thanks all, also to the Office of Students um, and um, a bit that was put in, as I say, kind of driven on the whole hybrid, high flex way of teaching uh, by our, our academics. And um, so, as I say, we've got the, we've had this evolving teaching model. The whole project is called Creative Inclusive Learning. Um, the Office for Students has the full details uh, on their website. Um, HiFlex is one of the elements of the project. Uh, we've also got uh, virtual reality immersive learning um, sub-project within the, the funding. Um, so we're currently do some, doing some research on VR um, and looking at immersive learning space as well on campus. Um, we have uh, a project board and we have uh, our operations uh, project team. So I'm on the project team, which represents different areas of the college. Um, and then up within the DigEd team, I'm also leading an operations team in terms of what uh, you know, decisions that are made at a higher level, how that then works, putting things in place, um, getting the messages out and supporting our lecturers. Um, so we started our project, I want to say particular thanks to uh, colleagues from City University, King's University and Greenwich University 
because we did do a number of visits um, before we even um, got started just looking at really good audio and sound. Um, as Jim, uh, Jim Oka said, you know, thinking about audio being king even over the visual and it's similar in, in high flex as well. Um, we've got, uh, we've been able to create a sort of a test bed prototype room, which we're now in consultation with academics over in terms of the, the um, consistency of the audio and video, uh, and video, the location of the video in the room, the, the number of screens, how we uh, facilitate the gallery of students styling in, um, and that's going to be facilitated in Teams um, uh, and screen sharing um, resources uh, and uh, digital whiteboards, etc via Teams. Um, so we, we've now got a sort of testing area. Let's say we've started our consultation. Um, we, we are getting some good um, input from academics in terms of different subject areas and the kind of room setup that they might be looking for pertaining to different, um, their different subjects. Um, and we've also started our uh, kind of development programme where we're thinking of, you know, think about high flex pedagogy, how to design or adapt your module in terms of high flex methodologies. Um, and then before we start our official pilot at the beginning of the next academic year, um, we'll do a sort of practice in terms of the on-campus tools um, within the classroom. So yeah, we do have an official pilot and uh, we are encouraging our, our lecturers that, you know, if they've got um, well-designed Moodle modules, which they should have now, I've had three years to, to do that. Um, and if they've taught in different classrooms across the estate, which are all set up in different ways. So if they've got those skills, they should be able to adapt um, to high flex as well as working with any of the synchronous activities. So thinking about the equitability of high flex, the fact that online students um, can and should expect the same level of teaching and learning experience remotely as they get in the classroom. So where which tools can be used for Moodle synchronously, what other kind of um, website tools can, can also be, be used like Miro, Mentimeter, et cetera. Um, and these are our, our aims in terms of, you know, originally what we, why we thought we'd um, work on this project and what we're looking at achieving. Um, so yeah, so I've, I've kind of, uh, set out this is our communication to our, our colleagues in terms of how they can help themselves as uh, so we've got 40 people on the pilot next year in the main we're working towards um 24 25 where uh, we're working on having the bulk of our estate having a high flex hybrid classroom design um so that it's a bit of a, a long game but this is just a five minute lightning presentation about what we've done so far. <laughs> and that's it. Any questions? No. Do you have any um, pictures of what the classroom looks like? Um, sorry, I shall. I, 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 no. And one of the reasons is because every time I go in there, the moment keeps changing. <laughs> Um, but essentially, it's uh, two screens uh, here. One screen that, so from from the lecturer's point of view, there's two screens side by side, and there's another screen at the back, which I'm hoping would be on wheels, so they have like the gallery view of the, the students dialed in. So then you can either sort of see it at the back or move it to the side if you if you want to. We've we've set the room out in kind of group work mode rather than rows so that because uh, one of the things I was thinking about with with high hybrid teaching is do you need a front and back of the room but in terms of the equipment you kind of have to um, and and also one of the reasons it's changing so much is because of the value of the the funding and the money now compared to you know ordering the kit the lead in times how much that kit is going to end up costing there's all those kind of things to consider. So we have to really be a little bit agile, I think, in terms of our uh, what we eventually decide on, but we, we haven't um, nailed down our specification yet. Um, I hope to do that at the end of this month. Um, and I'll be our intention 
is um, at some point to return the favour, particularly for those colleagues that I've mentioned, in terms of inviting people to come and have a look. So we'll let you know. We've got something more definite to show you but at the moment. It's a little bit uh, crazy every time I go in there. <laughs> yeah. A, um, a question from Menorah online. Um, appreciate that the full data is not available yet, but how does staff feel about this overall? Do you think it's a kind of ambient response at the moment? Um, yeah, the, there's that. It was uh, fairly straightforward in terms of getting um, volunteers uh, for the pilot. Um, as I say, there's an element of uh, colleagues having driven this uh, by virtue of the fact that a lot of people were delivering in a hybrid way last year, and we didn't really have the setup or the support. Of people to be able to support them, um, but they were doing it anyway. Certainly, one of our uh, art academics mentioned to me the other day that her student, uh, one of her students, came in, and one of the other students was on holiday and said, "Can you dial me into the lecture?" And there, the, she dialed her, her, her fellow student in on FaceTime. Um, so again, it's one of those things that which I've found in, in my career in terms of. If you don't provide it, students will find a way of doing things anyway. Um, so obviously it's something that we, we feel is, is going to be very suited to our um, demographic of students. And one quick follow on. How do you manage the bookings? Is it? Sorry. It's a lot of against you back. Yeah, you touched on it there. Did, um, did Bert Beck... Uh, upgrade the technology in rooms for kind of the pandemic hybrid teaching and you know what house what maybe what you what you learned from that and what's different. Um we haven't really upgraded our any of the technology in our state for a while. We we had a new building open a couple of years ago on Euston Road um and we had uh, some new rooms open last year uh in the what used to be the University <coughs> of London Union. Um, and they were quite quickly put together and they facilitate hybrid, but they're not designed for hybrid. So basically what we learned from that was we need to take a bit longer and we need to try and decide uh, design for this way of teaching um, as opposed to just setting up some equipment and hoping it will work in the right way. We did quite a lot of upgrading. We had to be near the end of a new building project as all this happened. So I'd be happy to show you around. Oh right, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, you're right. Uh, it's, it's how do you manage the bookings? Is it oh. is it interested participants? Is it by subject matter? Who gets to use a, a high flex space? Uh, well, it, it will be the room bookings allocating the teaching and the, and the people in the pilot. We've had to um, manage expectations in terms of the fact that these new rooms won't be ready till a year after. So. They're still going to be working with what we're calling high flex alpha in our existing estate, but with some of the, the planning and the design uh, regards to high flex pedagogy on the modules and feeding back to us. Um, in terms of the test bed area room, we, we've um, got we use so much soft bookings forms, and we've had quite a lot of, as I say, the enthusiasts through the door quite in a very short space of time. Um, and then we, in terms of the pilot and sort of catching everybody, then we, we've got digital education partners related to the different schools. So anyone who's sort of missing can get picked up by those people in terms of staff development. Thank you. Well, what do you use from like a PC side? Is it like bring your own device and kind of standard input or what is it? It's been one of our main questions. Do you want to use your own laptop? Which actually we had uh, facilitated that in our rooms last year. Um, it created quite a lot of um, training and support needs uh, over and above the what we'd experienced when we had a fixed PC in the room. So it's one been one of our most deliberate um, discussions in terms of, you know, what do people prefer um, and there's an element of the but we'd like both we'd like to be able to map you know and obviously in terms of managing everything through teams a lot of people have their own laptops and they can set up the teams with their apps because we're obviously going to plan on the Microsoft whiteboard app the Panopto app integrated with teams um, so people want to manage it via there um, but also in terms of going into a room and being able to press a couple of buttons to have all the screens on in the right way and the computer. And that's like the most 
kind of efficient way and not having to rely on people training and support all the time. So we've, I think we've come to the conclusion we need to mix of both if it's possible, where it's possible. Is there, sorry, is there any consideration from like a, a scheduling perspective in terms of allowing additional time? Um, so like ensuring there's a gap between sessions to the lecturers to set up. I know that's what we found is that it can eat into lecture time with people having to get set up on lecture and PCs and things like that. Uh, that's a very good point. Thank you. I'll take that back. <laughs> it's not something that we've encountered necessarily in any of our other teaching rooms, but um, I appreciate you sharing that information. Yeah. I, I was just going to add on a similar note. What did you learn when you went to other places? Um, I think it, it helped us, well, it helped me as a, a sort of pedagogian staff developer to get a picture of what, how I wanted to see things and how efficient they wanted them to be switched on. Um, and for my colleagues in uh, ITS who are the budget holders and who are looking at the specification of the equipment, you know, they were able to ask colleagues in the, in the other universities that we visited, you know, what's the main model of, for example, the, the um, microphones that we've got, the uh, <coughs> Sennheiser, and they're about the same size as these, and, and there's only two of them in a room that's larger than this, and it picks up from all around and you just can speak normally. Um, and that's something that's been very popular from people we've had visiting the room. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to resume the share. There we go. Let's take over. I'll talk first. Hi everybody, I'm Jason Norton from the University College London and my co-presenter Sue Harrison from King's College. Hello. So we're here to talk about the transition of digital education teams um, to, um, to Agile. So first of all, what is Agile? Agile is a project methodology uh, and approach that involves breaking their project into multiple phases and it emphasizes continuous collaboration and improvement. And the teams involved follow a cycle of planning, executing, revising, reviewing, and evaluating. Um, I've tried to give four key points here. So it, Agile emphasizes flexibility, customer collaboration. Um, methodologies promote adaptive planning, short development cycles, so quick turnover um, of iterations known as sprints. So for example, we run two weekly sprints. Um, at its core, Agile is guided by the Agile Manifesto and four key principles. And the flexibility and iterative nature of Agile makes it actually particularly suitable um, for the technology environments um, where, it's needs, where things change rapidly and we need to adapt. Um, I want to put th these are the four, um, what's my heading? Um, four sort of, not principles, so the values pillars. of Agile. It says pillars behind them. Yeah. Uh, pillars, <laughs> values. So individuals and interactions over process and tools, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan, and working software over comprehensive documentation. Now, a lot of you probably know that Agile has origin, its origins are in software development practice. It, um, but also going back even further, its origins actually go into manufacturing before that, and right back to um, Toyota's DPS. So, however, Make it a bit more sort of focused on area. So individual interactions. So we value the expertise and collaboration of our team members and, and rigid, over rigid processes and tools. We prioritize open communication, active listening, and effective teamwork to create innovative technology solutions, which is what pretty much all of my learning technologies have done all the time anyway. Customer collaboration. Well, we believe in actively collaborating with our customers, our staffs, our students um, through the development process, engaging with them and make, helping them to make the decisions and for us to be guided by those decisions. Responding to change over following a plan. Now, we embrace change as an opportunity to improve and enhance our own technologies all the time. This is the things that come up all the time throughout what we do every single session, every single week, every single term, new things happen all the time. We adapt and change to those. And working software competence documentation. So we prioritize the development and delivery 
of working educational solutions. So let's change that a bit. So working educational solutions are the comprehensive documentation. It doesn't mean that top documentation is important. Well, actually, what we deliver is more important than my writing copious amounts of documentation in the background. So the story for UCL. We had a new chief technology officer in 2020. At the same time, as obviously something else hit in 2020, which had a big impact on us. Um, Andy, our CTO, uh, basically watched us for that year, that first year. And they basically said, we're coming out, child. I think it's the way to move forward. We're going to be one, probably one of the first in the entire sector to do it. So in, at the very start of 2021, we moved to Safe Agile, and that was the whole of our information services department. So I work in um, digital education. I used to be the digital education services manager. My remit, used to, I had basically six learning technologists, four junior learning technologists, and technical teams working for me. And we converted all of those to Agile. So. First of all, obviously, training and a, a high-level restructure. Thing for Shuffle, we got changed around. I became a product owner, and we had service owners who sort of dropped away into the background and became technical experts. So we have service operations manager who became technical leads, and we were formed into these product teams. So my product started off as virtual learning environments, and it's already changed. And we also established a centre of excellence around Agile within Information Service Division to basically provide guidance about Agile. We receive training and then basically we're on your way. That's it. Go for it. You've got a new product. And this is basically what we're told to do. We're told to go away, try, fail and learn and repeat it constantly. And all within, we have something called SAFE, which stands for Scaled Agile Framework. And it's um, one of the frameworks for Agile. There are, there are numerous ones. And this is basically one that seems good for an enterprise level of an organization. And what we did, this is meant to look like a mess because <laughs> that's actually what it was. It was a really challenging nearly two years now, and we're still doing it. The whole point about Agile is you are constantly almost recreating yourself. My product team alone has gone through basically three or four mini restructures changes as we've learned and found out what does work what doesn't work what actually makes us work harder or work slower and we, so i said you know redesign sprints so in agile we now run four term increments a year big planning sessions where all of isd come together and plan what we're going to be doing for the next 12 weeks we have robots so this next 12 weeks this is what we're doing and any other member from any other team can come in and sit in on our teams and go oh what are you doing Oh, that actually connects with something we're doing over a student. Oh, have you considered these things? Do you want to build them in? So we get a lot more interactions now with our teams. Now, I know I'm moving quickly because I know we're a bit short on time. Two things that didn't work. One, we when we had my team and we moved into a product, we were still doing within the product, we had first and second line support. So sort of standard um, many staff academic support teaching and um, learning activities, uh, training sessions, standard things that are, are based on learning technologies, our core learning technologies, their bread and butter work. Suddenly, they found themselves in this new environment, this new product team that had a, quite a heavy bent towards technical, because we've taken the technical team, the guys at the back end who normally sit in a dark room somewhere and don't really talk to anybody, and put them front and center. And now everybody's engaging. And what it did, it, it actually caused job dissatisfaction for our learning technologies. They suddenly found that, well, for some of them, they suddenly found that it's not what they want to do. It's not what they envisage as being the learning technologist role. However, for some of the learning technologists, that's where, actually, this, this, is, this is different. This is, this is something I can see me actually adapting and changing. So what we actually did is we, we've now got different types of learning technologists. This was an evolution for learning technologist roles. So basically, we have products learning technologists. And those learning technologies are specific to the product they're in. So within my digital learning environment um, product, I have learning technologies who are really infused on what to be learning at Moodle. They might want to look at a little bit of coding, they want to look at a little bit of data analytics, but they still want to be engaging with our academics because that's what they are. They're still learning technologies. They've got that knowledge of our institution, of our pedagogy, and they can interact at a different level. But we've also got the support team, which is running as a, a separate little product now. Um, not in the same way, but they've got the learning technologies, which are more as normal learning technologies might be, still delivering training, 
and still you know, engage with academics, or we've created feedback cycles at different levels that feed into the relevant, relevant activities of the team. So that's enabled us to actually move faster and de develop and deliver value a lot faster. Well, on to the next point. Running in sprints does not work for sport teams, it doesn't work for all teams. So running in sprints, me, as I said, we, we have a, a, a planning cycle where we do 12 weeks, don't do 12 weeks. That 12 weeks is then split down into two week sprints. So every two weeks we say, we sit down, have a planning session, you go, What's, what are we doing this week? Plan, work, those two weeks. Plan, work, those two weeks. That doesn't work when you've just got support tickets coming in. But those day-to-day -day operational things, they say, oh, here's something that needs to be fixed. Here's something that needs to be fixed. We come, that doesn't work for standard support. So the way we come around this, they still work within agile principles and agile values, because that, that doesn't go away. Those principles that we spoke about at the start, they still underpin everything. We just set to a different, slightly different methodology. We use Kanban, which is basically a pull approach. So that they have a backlog of tickets. They go, fine, taking that one. And that's basically, um, then we have a continuous flow. And we have uh, teams who are doing this sort of work have something called an ADM or Agile Delivery Manager. And we have Agile Delivery Managers in our other product teams that are running sprints. And they talk to each other. It's a crazy concept, but they talk to each other. So, you know, we've got a deployment support team coming up. In four weeks' time, can you put that on your board just to let you know? We've got we know because we're pre-planning. So the support teams are actually now more informed about what's going on. Um, that was one of our biggest challenges: communication. Um, what's good? Change is now a constant factor in what we do. We are constantly thinking about how we can improve. Teams are, are empowered to make things happen. That whole going back to that, we, we can fail. We can we actually go, well, let's try something. Oh, it didn't work. Doesn't matter. Let's try something new. And the teams are empowered to make the decisions themselves. They are autonomous. Teams are more responsive and have agility. We, the old time, you know, turning on the head of a pin, we can have actually so much agility that we are able to stop mid-process of deployment and just go, oh, we're going in this direction now. That, that's not going to work without impacting any of our deliverables. If something doesn't bring value to our end users, we challenge it and go, why are we even doing it? If it doesn't bring value, why do it at all? And that, because we've got the sort of buying of our CTO, we can sort of escalate these problems right up to the top of the organization now. And we have done, and it's been really actually one of the biggest things that I've noticed is that, is that change doesn't just have to happen because someone might think they've got a good idea about a particular product or assessment tool. More engagement with stakeholders. We work a lot more now with our end users, especially those back end guys I told you about, our, our, our Moodle devs and things. Now, actually, every two, every end of sprint, we have a demo. We have we have stakeholders coming in, the people who are actually wanting that functionality, sitting in the room, looking at how far our dev teams have got, and actually going, oh, actually, that's not exactly what I meant. Could you manage to do that? This leads to faster delivery of value to our end users. Things that don't always necessarily work. The new ways of working clash with other parts of, of the organization. There's, you know, only ISD has gone agile. And actually convincing and making other people within the in the organization understand what that means has been quite a challenge. So people outside of the product team still think of what we call waterfall or big design up front. And that's the idea where you sat in a room, make, made a 200 page document about what you're going to deliver. And then, you know, when you get to the end of that, whatever it is, it's not actually what you deliver and it's completely changed and probably worthless. Um, and it's also, it's not easy to move on from old practice, you know, with the, UTL is an older organization, yeah, a very formal organization, and a lot of old guard who are very used to doing things in particular ways. So some of those challenges have been a sort of a, a people problem. So two things to take away from me. Agile is a mindset first and foremost. It's not about, that's what I haven't gone, that's how I haven't spoken about too much about things like sprints and retros and all those wonderful words that are associated with agile. Because it, it's in, it's in here, and it's got to be in here for your leadership teams, because they've got to drive the agile through the organisation. And this one is key to my team: is the ability to fail safe and fail fast. And what that means is fail safe means psychological safety, and fail fast means local failure. So psychological safety. This means that people in the team can fail. There's no blame. They can actually go, oh, well, we'll try something and feel perfectly great. And, they, and they'll receive commentary and actually go, oh, John, that didn't actually work that well. That's probably because you didn't do this piece of code or we didn't speak to that person. And there was no comeback on that because it's psychological safety. That's one of the things you have to promote. And the other thing is fail fast. Now, fa fail fast is one of the things to really understand about agile. Because of that agility, it enables you to try things 
and fail rather than build, 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 build. Here you go, um, Mr. Customer, there's what we've done for you. That's exactly not what I wanted. And you spent £200,000 on that. Whereas every two weeks we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. And they go, well, actually, you know, that changed that little bit there. Oh, there's a little trick, lowest cost failure. So actually our overall costs have come right down because of this. And at the end of the cycle, we're actually delivering value and what our end users want. And I think that's me. Oh, no, two more slides. This is where we started at Just Say Change. This is where we started at the very start. We called the education domain products. We had core teaching platforms, digital assessment, education design, media, teaching spaces, digital resource recovery. And this is where we are now, literally as of now. Um, we're just undergoing an, another change. So we now got digital learning environments, which is my area, assessment and feedback, critical management, mini rights, and learning engagement. And the whole point is that it constantly evolves. Thank you, and I'll pass over. Thank you. Um, so aware of time, I'll just pick out a few kind of um, key points for, for colleagues. I think the first thing to say is, um, things is far earlier in our journey than UCL is. We are about two years in. We are six months in. So we have run two of those three monthly planning sessions so far. The second being about two or three weeks ago, which Jason did um, did attend. Um, but it's very interesting to see. I think we've already got quite some similar takeaways, which I think is um, is interesting. Um, so um, it says why agile at the top, but just to pick out a couple of reasons as to why Pings has decided to make a move into more more of an agile mindset um, from the IT perspective. Uh, the first is around culture. Um, it's identified that we have a, a large, old institution. We have a lot of silos. And what we actually want to do is kind of empower people and foster a sense of collaboration, kind of decentralize that decision making to, to allow us to shift away from projects, design everything up front and then deliver into products and services. What is it you want? Can we show you? Can we show what we've done? Can you help us improve, et cetera? Um, the second being around um, capacity to bring together more cross-functional teams. So now my team, um, CTEL, Centre of Technology Enhanced Learning, has always worked very closely with an educational applications team in King's, but now each of our sub-teams that we now have in Agile are made up of members of both of those areas. We work together a lot more closely. We have the technical side, we have the pedagogic side that we try and work together more closely. Um, a big one, um, which I think a lot of people, it will resonate with a lot of people, is around prioritization. This removal of the hippo. I hadn't heard of the hippo, but I love it. The, the highest paid person's opinion, um, which we um, I think happens in a lot of places. And the aim of this is that we improve transparency and consistency in prioritization. Um, as I say, we are very early doors with this, but we've already been able to get in um, some stakeholders, get in some people's opinions, make sure that what we say we're doing is actually the priority of the institution. We've still got a long way to go, but we're starting to get better at that. And then uh, the final one is around governance. The old university adage, why make a decision when you can form a committee? Um, we're trying to get away from that to allow governance to be um, minimum viable, is, is the phrase that we've been um, been using, so that we can jump through fewer hoops when it comes to the governance perspective. So these are kind of why King's decided on the, um, on the Agile journey. As I say, we're six months in counting. In mid-February, we got asked to jump into this, um, which was in the midst of our annual Moodle upgrade. So I'm not certain I'd do it the same again. We went from a very horizontal approach to delivering a project to trying to shift that around to being a very vertical approach to delivering in two week sprints. It's been a learning curve, but it's, I think to start with an existing project, if, if any of your institutions are going agile, I'm not certain I'd go that way, but we're, we are where we are. So we ran our first planning event at the end of March. We then ran through three months worth of Agile, ran a second planning event, and then our big upgrade day is a, day to, is a week today, not that it's imprinted on my, on my mind. Mm -hmm. So we are, um, we've run two of these planning sessions and our next one will then be in October. We will then plan for our next three months worth of work. And then um, a lot of these are very similar to, um, to what Jason said about kind of benefits and challenges. I will just highlight a couple. Uh, one is that we, um, it's been very useful for, us to, useful for us to consider Agile as about providing predictability more than being relentless on what we're doing. It's a two-week sprint, it's a two-week sprint, it's a two-week sprint. This is about us sharing 
how we can predictably deliver what we've said we've delivered. So I think that was our, our mindset felt a little bit, oh, we felt a little bit overwhelmed as to all of these meetings, all of these things coming. And when you think about it as actually you're planning to be predictable and not have to ditch this product, ditch this um, you know, aim that you had, you know, de-scope, de-scope with a project. That's been, um, that's been very useful for us. Um, but I think that the final one to mention is just that we are, um, we are a pilot where IT in UCL went everybody. We're the first pilot in Kings from an IT perspective, and it's now being disseminated out as to other teams and other areas. So we're, we're a little bit more step by step as we, um, as we go forward. But that does mean we live in old governance and new governance and old ways of um, horizontal working and new ways of vertical working. So there's a lot of joining the dots, but it has been a, a nicely positive experience for us. And then finally, just to mention, um, Kings will be expanding it out to other areas, which we're interested to see and interested to help with. We will also be expanding it out to other areas within the digital education side. We haven't done physical classrooms, for example, as, a, as an area at the moment. And then I think a big thing for us is we have learning technologists working as product owners. That does cross over really well in some places, but we need to learn and mature how product ownership will work for us in, in Kings as we go forward. But I'll leave it there where we are 10 minutes over. Any questions? Questions online? Questions? Anybody have any questions? What would you keep from the old governance? Do you want to do anything? No. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I can't think of anything that we'd like to keep. Um, there are sort of bits that run ITIL and sort of service methodologies, and they actually get in the way of the agile delivery practice because there are things associated with agile, such as DevOps, that should be replacing those items. Yeah, I would agree. I think that there's that the old governance has probably built over decades and it can be very complicated and jumping through lots of hoops. This actively tries to remove governance where it's not useful. And that has been very empowering, at least for us. So the questions on the chat, um, there's both one is, how do you use data to inform your changes, both to practice and to direction, and what kind of data? So one of the key things I think about is that it's what you're talking about. It's um, how we know what is going to happen during the sprint. Um, we've got to a point now where we, we can size items, pieces of work, and we have a basically a, what's called a work in progress score. So we know how much work we can put into the system that we can deliver very accurately. So we know we can actually say to our end users, as you said, we can go, actually, in two weeks' time, you can have this. In four weeks' time, you can have that. And we can be confident about those, whereas before we, we didn't have that ability. And it's only by sort of going through the, the steps and using tools such as Jira and understanding things like burn down charts, um, which we learn about if you do, if you do agile, is you actually, it becomes much more predictable about what you can do and what you can deliver. Um, in regards to what's the question? Other... What kind of um, what kind of data? Uh... So what kind of other data? I'm not sure. I think. So when when we start something, we try and identify what data can help us make informed decisions on that. But there is no set this data or that data or whatever data. It really depends on the thing you're doing. And in the same way, it would inform a business case. It informs an epic in agile terms as to what you're kind of delivering. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a specific set of data. It really depends on what you're delivering. It wasn't, it wasn't in there was a team to we, we know things called spike stories, which are basically information gathering stories. So for one spring, we actually dedicate a couple of go, actually, we need to find out as much as we can about this piece of technology which we don't know anything about and build some understanding. And the second question is uh, How have staff involved responded to constant change and iteration? From experience, not everyone has the same appetite for this and yet still have very valuable perspectives to bring to the table. How much have you flexed your agile approach or found ways to still engage these staff? Well, that's quite a tough one. Um, we have lost staff, I'll be honest. We have lost some staff um, because I don't think they felt that the change was good for them. Um, but at the same time, we've also gained a lot of new staff who have sort of come into this from other institutions quite fresh, but they haven't experienced how UCL was before and have found it really 
stimulating. Um, have we adapted? I think it's it's a part of the process that you do going through the iterative changes because we're all on it's basically a, it's a joint discovery. Uh, and but you know when you refer back to sort of the underpinning principles and, and values that you're trying to do, it comes down to delivering value to the end users. I don't think anyone is really against that. Um, the way we do things has actually enabled people to become more empowered, be able to flex and go. It's opened up uh, multiple job pathways. So I think overall it's it's been good for most people. Yeah, we're, we're perhaps a little bit earlier on in the journey to have kind of, you know, people leave or whatever. We basically ask people to kind of come with us for six months, see how it's working, see how it looks, you know, feedback every time we have a retro, every two weeks we feedback, etc. Um, I think there's been a lot of positives. It is, a, it is a change for people and some people adapt to that better, that better than others, but it's not been widely negatively received in any way, shape or form. And it takes time. You know, we're, we're two years down the road. And we are all still learning. Um, I'm actually on my third Agile delivery manager. Um, and one of my latest Agile delivery is exceptional. And she's, she brought things to the, the team that we hadn't even considered before. It, it's changed the general team. It's changed people's outlook on the team. Um, and she said, retro. When we started, retro, retro, a retrospective is, is, is one of the what they call ceremonies that we have. We sit through every two weeks. And it, it's basically, see, well, how did it go for you? What, what, what happened? Can we help with anything? And I, I remember our first months of retros were literally slims because no one wanted to say anything about the work. They didn't want to talk about the work. They didn't want to talk about other people's work. But now you get to say we can't shut people up. So yeah, there's been there's been big changes. And I think it's something you've got and to with. When you get something back for retro and then you change it, that adds so much value to people as they go, all right, I spoke up and now I've seen a positive change. Well, not that flag wavy, but you know, it's been good. How important are things like Jira and kind of keeping everybody aware of what's going on? Incredibly important. So we use a different tool. We we use Azure DevOps. Um, you live and die by the tooling, to be perfectly honest. It's it is everything. Yeah. And you have to obviously figure out how you configure it. Yeah. That's why we had our center of excellence. So we had experts at the start to bring and, and show. And I said upfront training for the key roles, the product owner. The agile delivery manager, scrum master roles all have to have training up front. Thank you. There's no more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wait for people to settle themselves. Uh, for those in the room that haven't met me before, I'm Don Thomas, and we're from City University of London. Uh, we're going to talk today about a an engineering program that uh, was previously run as a fully in-person activity that ran through the same emergency online that everybody else did, and then came uh, and then how we helped them to go online in a more purposeful way. And the um, design service that we got to launch off the back of that, uh, as well. We'll add in a little bit of we'll talk a little bit about some of the redesign that we did within that. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the feedback that we got from uh, staff and students. And so, where else? So, um, my my role in the institution is as a relationship lead. So, I spend my time sitting with sitting and talking with academics and trying to interpret their uh, talk into sort of digital education stuff uh, in, in a way and help them to understand where we're coming from as well um the the program that they've been looking at which uh for those of you that missed a bit at the top in the room uh, is called the msc temporary works and construction method engineering so it's something that's really built for um construction and um engineering professionals people in careers who spend their time working on construction sites and want to get uh, a professional qualification now, typically, that's something it's quite difficult if you are uh, a builder to get time off site to go and do a degree. Um, so this has been one of the challenges that you know, the, the, the sector has been asking for this particular degree for decades. City is one of the, the few providers of this particular degree. But the course has always had struggle, uh, struggle to get people in the room, uh, basically, to, to come to this. 
So they came, they came to me a few years ago and said, we'd like to take this online to see if we can give our students a bit more flexibility, see if we can um, expand this offer as well. I mean, obviously people build buildings everywhere. It's not just in, in London or Newcastle where people do. Um, can we expand our market out a bit as well? Um, <laughs> And in doing that, they wanted to do a few things they hadn't really been able to do on their on their own in quite the same way. Um, there's a large amount of visiting lecturers, most of it's delivered by visiting lecturers. Uh, and so that has meant that they were able to get some great expertise in, in the programme, but it meant very little consistency on the, the modules. So the student experience was very erratic, very inconsistent. And the student experience is something they wanted to focus on as well. So they came to us and said, can you help us to do that? Um, here we go. So this is you. Thanks, Tom. So my role is a learning design role at City. So it's a relatively new thing for City. We may be familiar with Leonard Hout, who was in our base business school, who was in a similar role in terms of instructional design, but obviously very similar to learning design. So many institutions are now creating more learning design type roles. There are a few people from UCL here, and you see the ABC. That's really pushed people to think more about uh, the pedagogic aspects and the link between uh, technology, um, pedagogy, and learning activities. So you're all familiar with ABC, the idea of storyboarding workshops. Uh, we started those during the pandemic, so we had just a horrible PowerPoint kind of approach. We say horrible, but it's best we could do it at the time, kind of crude approach. And then uh, we move to Miro. So I'll show you examples, I think, more from uh, Miro. I'll be your next slide, please, Guy. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, yeah. And then there's the usual kind of things around. Sorry, Don, if you could just go back to the other one. Uh, there's the usual things around the Moodle consistency, multiple module leaders, 27 visiting lecturers. Uh, because there were so many guest lecturers, we asked for introductory videos for each week of the module, or if someone was doing two or three weeks, there was one, just so the students got a flavor understanding of what this person's expertise were. One was an engineering slash lawyer, uh, one would be a marine expert uh, from Milford Haven. So they all have very interesting backgrounds. This was a chance to get to know them before uh, synchronous teaching, which was one day, it was a day release on a Thursday, one module in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, obviously trying to get people to prepare in advance uh, through Moodle to do some initial reading, uh, live teaching done in Teams, recordings on Echo, uh, having a project manager, I won't say too much about this other thing, really helpful, you know, so many things to pull together. Um, it feels a bit like a luxury to have that, but it was uh, super helpful in keeping all this moving. It made the difference between it happening and it not happening, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was really helpful, yes. So I think you know all about storyboard. I'm not going to say too much about this, but you understand everything around learning activities, constructive alignment, uh, things like that. So I won't say too much on that because we've got quite a few things uh, to get through. So this is an example of a kind of remixed storyboard based on ABC. But those of you who are very observant will notice immediately the heresy is here. There are only three learning activity types people. Nobody tell Diamond or Allard, please. Put you on Twitter there, um, But I mean, there's, there's a reason for that to do with people. The experience we had initially was people would get into semantic discussions around is this production or is it practice? Is it discussion? Is it collaboration? I'm confused. Um, not to say that we aren't open to going back to using six types. I think the Agile talk earlier on was very interesting. And I think our approach really should be flexible and open to how different people work and see things. This is our particular take on it, but we would be open to doing it a different way. You'll see also the support and guidance is a specific um, thing on here that gets indicated uh, on a storyboard. And that comes a little bit from Sally Parsley, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Saw her mirror storyboard a couple of years ago. It's great that people are sharing this openly get different ideas about how people uh, do this. Then the usual thing about formative and summative uh, assessment. Thank you, Don. Uh, this is an example for the engineering one because the structure was there is synchronous teaching on a Thursday. What would you do before? What would you do after? Got learning outcomes at the top 
uh, you know, just the usual details about who's teaching it. Some attempt to consider the time, how long things take. So that's a, a less standard structure. But on, on the next one, you'll see uh, more standard structures. So some of the thinking behind this came from uh, Sam Branson, who was former director of digital learning at Bayes Business School. And I mean, it's not rocket science in a way, but I think it's interesting, the cult question around the level of detail you put in storyboard. And our experience has been that people find a structure like this quite helpful uh, in it. You have lectures, what happens before, what happens after. Uh, then you have something like a lab seminar or tutorial. And again, you wouldn't necessarily need to populate every column. So you're not always asking people to do something before and after a lecture, before and after a lab. Again, there's a degree of flexibility here. Uh, and you'll see that there is the support and guidance kind of element. So some of that could be around digital capabilities. So one way we're looking to iterate this storyboard, for example, is how can we show or develop digital capabilities for students? Another institutional initiative would be graduate attributes. So again, we're being asked, well, is there a way of indicating that our curricula, we're moving to a curriculum management system, and our president is very keen on this kind of systematic design thinking uh, type approach, and he would like it to be explicit in the design of curricula to know where graduate attributes are being included. Uh, so again, that's another layer that we will at some point think about adding in uh, at the bottom there. Uh, timing thing as usual. Okay, thank you, Don. So the modules, because uh, there are different people teaching, we just we don't always have images in them. Uh, just little Photoshop hacks to stick into the opening sections of modules, overview videos, you know, the usual kind of technical things around. It'd be nice to have the video embedded on the page and can do a few, but then it'll really slow our middle down and breaks it. And then signposting or weekly plans. So being really clear, because it's fully online program, what's the expectation people should do? We did uh, some infographics using tool called Visly, which I think is a really interesting tool. Um, it's very similar to Vengage or Picture Chart, or if you author in the web browser, it's similar to Illustrator, but outputs HTML, uh, completely responsive. It's a really good way of summarizing, uh, for example, uh, assessments, what happens in assessments, we know from NSS and other feedback, students are really unclear, well, what type of assessments, what's the weighting, they have to power through uh, module specs, program handbooks, it's not very student friendly, so for online programs we are using Bisley, we'd like to roll that out further, but institutional politics, let's not go there, uh, so here's the things you should do, be very clear in advance about the schedule and things like that, so we don't that's me now, isn't it? Okay, over to you. Yeah. So um, it has to be said, as I indicated at the beginning, um, that there's a fairly small number of students on this program. So it was, it's quite important for the uh, the, the school and the, the engineering department itself to offer this program. There's a relatively small number of students. That said, there was very, very good attendance and engagement. Uh, attendance with the live sessions. Yeah. Some of them were, you know, High up a middle of a building site somewhere. Uh, we ended up doing things like uh, in, you know, a, piloting a uh, hybrid field trip. So sending a camera crew up into Durham to a, a, a fake aquifer where they were doing some uh, experiments there and feeding the images from the, uh, the field back out into, the, uh, uh, into the, the Teams meetings where the live sessions were happening. Uh, we also sort of polled the students fairly regularly as well, surveyed them fairly regularly. And uh, we found that there were an awful lot of, uh, there, there was some really good satisfaction. So uh, it was kind of as we'd hoped it would be, really. Can we get a consistent experience with, you know, that, that um, basically feels good for them? So we had clarity around um, the expectations for assessment. This was a just such an important thing. We so rarely get to go into the detail of that in our role as learning technologists. You know, we look at it and you come to it from a critical perspective afterwards and go, how does a student know where their assessment is? So being able to make sure that they knew where, exactly where it was, was really important. Um, obviously there was an authenticity to the assessments anyway, but uh, being able to bring that, uh, students really appreciated the, the quality of the learning resources that we're able to produce in there. I'll just have one thing, Don, that I didn't mention. It's a world of pain, but we went through 
every lecture presentation and we had the usual thing where people uh, were coming along with 160 slides. In some cases they were kind of photos of uh, site engineering sites and they were very useful. Uh, in other cases, we had someone in a sort of legal engineering background and it was 160 slides of text. So trying to, the whole subject matter expert thing, trying to work with these people and you know scale that down um, was slightly tricky. But one way we did that was, as mentioned already by Jacoba, the whole chunking thing. Uh, so we went through all the slides and they were not accessible either, colors, the images, etc. So we had to go through um, eight modules worth of slides. So um, yeah, let's not go there. It was painful, but I think it, the students did appreciate that and it brought consistency and clarity to it. And we also offered sessions for the visiting lecturers where we talked through these issues because they were engineers, not lecturers by and large, uh, to try and you know get them to think more about activities that might involve calculations or the design of engineering uh, problems rather than reading out their 160 slides for three hours. And that, to some extent, we had success. Other times, they did just read the slides, but it's an interesting kind of process. Having learned a new phrase today, it was basically our chance to wrestle some hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next thing we do have a case study video of um, the academics talking about the process. Now, um, because our time is a little bit limited today, I think we've decided that we're going to skip this particular bit and ask Amy if you're happy to uh, send the link out to the video afterwards. Um, but basically that's the the main story of the Temporary Works program, which end to end, before anybody uh, asks, this was two years of our lives uh, as well, I'll be, be, be honest with that one. So what did it lead to, Thomas? Well, I think it was something that we've been talking about over a number of years, uh, given the success of ABC, growth of learning design, interest in learning design, uh, to take this beyond this one initial pilot program and offer this as a service. Uh, so this is what we've got planned, we're calling it a digital learning design uh, service. And before we sort of explain a little bit about what that is, uh, we, we asked ourselves, you know, what, what, do we, what do we mean by this? What do we want to get out of it, all this sort of stuff? Uh, for me, the, you know, all these staff and students suddenly got this immersive experience, immersive uh, induction into the world of online blended digital learning through the, uh, the the fact of the pandemic. But it didn't necessarily stick in a lot of cases. I'm sure we've all gone back to offices and classrooms and lecture theatres and seen some things that we would recognise from 2019 or uh, 1890 or. <laughs> something something like that so uh, in my view in a in the simplest way to put um, we we make education better by design so the design part of it is a really really key part and i think that speaks to the design of learning spaces to the design of programs that sort of stuff so um we've got a definition that we're loosely working with uh, which you see at the top of the slide here um, we're defining our services and I'll read this out. A collaborative, flexible process uh, for the design, development, and delivery of effective, blended, hybrid, and online learning programs and modules. There's a lot of um, ed tech buzzwords in that one sentence. <laughs> I think, but uh, uh, hopefully, you unpack all of that. Then there's a lot of ambition in that particular uh, statement as well. And one of the ways that we kind of frame it or open the discussions with staff. These are some of the questions that we've also got here. So, you know, if staff are looking to improve their student engagement, if they're looking to um, think about designing activities to give their students a chance to practice real, you know, real life practice, making their module or their program more inclusive, um, or, you know, all this stuff that I've heard the government talking about and raging against and I've, you know, but nevertheless, I tasted a bit in the pandemic and I like to add a bit more into my program now, you know, this blended learning stuff that you're all talking about. Um, this is you. Thanks, Tom. So these are the kind of four routes into how you would access or why would you access our digital learning design service. Obviously new programs, uh, that's the kind of easiest starting point in a way and everything's fresh and you're involved right from the start. Uh, there aren't so many of them. Uh, they may or may not all want to engage with this. Of course, 
is uh, something that we offer, but they may have existing ways of working that they're going to be doing that, but we uh, also will do this for new programs. Periodic review, uh, switch in mode of delivery, we've given that example already blended uh, to online. And what I think that's particularly important actually is the fourth one of school initiatives for continuous improvement. It's not necessarily a, a sort of formal thing like a new program period. It shouldn't always be driven by very formal things. It should be driven, I guess, maybe this is too idealistic, uh, by just this belief that teaching I was a primary school teacher at one point. The culture in primary schools is you, you do your teacher training degree, new, newly qualified teacher, you have inset days, you have training, you reflect on your practice. It's something that it takes a lifetime to develop your teaching skills. Whereas I feel that the HE culture obviously is very different. Um, not everyone has a teaching qualification to begin with. But I think that fourth one, there are people certainly that we work with who do think, I just want to improve things. I can see from whatever module evaluations talking to students at NSS, whatever, um, that there's a, a lack of engagement or that we could do things differently. We have, there's always, you know, some key people in an institution. So in one of the schools Don works with, School of Science and Technology, the Dean really gets the whole blended learning importance of what we do digitally. It's been long commented on the amount of resource that goes into the estates in the university for learning spaces, how much money is spent on big lecture halls, yet the budget for Moodle or other sort of learning platforms has been quite limited, slightly changed a bit with the pandemic. But then, of course, post-pandemic, as already has been mentioned, we've got reversion to the mean. We've got, wow, well, that's all finished now. Let's just go back to how it was, which has happened to some significant degree, I think. Um, so this digital learning design service is uh, one attempt we're making to not revert to the mean, to say, let's carry on. Let's think about the design of learning activities in the different modes. We have done hybrid workshops as well, where we've amended the storyboard to work uh, with people teaching hybrid programs. And uh, last but one is you as well, Thomas. Yeah, there's a lot on there, but one, two, three, <laughs> you can see really. I think the key, thing, the key thing to say about this slide really actually is I think one of the risks with learning design methodologies, processes, or people talk a lot about agile and, and cultures and ways of thinking and ch it's a change management thing is. We're not saying we're the digital education team, you must do storyboarding, follow the ABC process, and everything will be magic. So, the key thing from this slide for me, anyway, is number one, which is finding out about their context, where they're at, what their priorities are. We have worked on some modules where, uh, luckily, someone had done some evaluation piece of research that was really handy. Um, might always have that. But I think, you know, anyone who was at the code learning design talk uh, a couple of months ago, was a really good discussion about starting from, we talked about starting from where students are at. Uh, I think with learning design, we need to start with where academics are at. We know about the time pressures. We know that really um, agile is going to be part of this. Though in most cases, they're not going to do wholesale transformation of their programs. I think it's going to be a case of picking out one or two things uh, and, and doing it that way. Uh, but starting from their own reflections, their own analysis of what it is they think the program needs. And then we flex to that. And we look to work with them on ideas to address those aims, um, unless it's a brand new program, in which case, great, it might involve more blue sky thinking. Uh, and then, yeah, we bring different people in, we bring all sorts of other people. Academic skills are part of our lead team uh, as well, multimedia people. So any of these other people could come in, academic developers, of course, and then we just give them some kind of cue of, well, here's the kind of things we can help you with. But actually, I think the starting point needs to be, yeah, have a context of knowing what we can offer so they don't ask us something completely outrageous. But the starting point really, I think, should be where they see the changes needed. Well, they may even ask us to, you know, give them some review of what they've done. And that's OK, but I think starting from where they're at is really important. So uh, in further summary of this slide, they start with a chat, we then have a deeper chat, and then we give them some options. Uh, in a way, there's a, basically a whole range of different options. Um, one, one of the reasons why uh, the ability to offer this service to our institution was so important to me, is I spent so many uh, um, years, I suppose, seeing schools wanting to do this sort of thing, and not having the, the capacity or the, the understanding that in-house could do this job for them and um, you know, raising far more money than they needed and going 
bringing somebody from outside that didn't know them. Not that there's anything wrong with, with um, working with contractors as well. Um, but one of the, the key things I think that's worked for this, the, the difference between getting a third party contractor in to build and design a course, uh, uh, a course for you, is we know that you know, the academics on this course, I've worked with them for, for several years. And I've been through different projects with them that have worked, some that have failed, some that have delivered, some that haven't. Uh, and that's built a kind of foundation level of trust with them. Where they can go, all right, well, as uh, Anora mentions in the, the, the chat, this looks like it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. We've got to deny that. But the school believed in us. They therefore invested in us to take time away from the rest of our work. Uh, so that we could focus on this um, and gave us a chance to do it uh, hopefully properly uh, as well. Um, final slide is, I think that goes to the um, current version of our online guide about it, which is a start. Um, something that we're looking to expand further, but this has got sort of, everybody will be quite familiar with sort of module baseline guidance. That's sort of our, our version of it on there as well. Um, the case study video, actually, that we were going to show is uh, is available on that site uh, as well. So um, that's kind of the talk. Amy, how do you want to play the next bit? Do you have any questions? I like your storyboard of the um, <laughs> collaboration. And, um, do you think students would find that useful to see that themselves, or do they see that? Could it be interactive? That's a really interesting question. What do you think of interest? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yes, I think, I think um, if it could be interactive, it could actually take you into places within your Moodle, wherever, and it just gives you a good, basically, the map, isn't it? Yeah, if you're, yeah. that's very really, yeah. yeah. interesting point. So, firstly, I think we don't involve students enough in learning design. I mean, for obvious reasons, it's quite difficult, the logistics. Um, you know, recruiting and getting them, you know, our students in particular, many of them that are working or anything, the undergraduate students several days a week, the commuter students, hard to get them in, we give incentives, um, but it's still even that doesn't always lead. We've tried this with, you know, various little research projects, focus groups, uh, etc. I think one thing we're keen on is trying to push that further. And then, yeah, I think there's something around how the storyboard is land sensitive, and that's your view. Academics teach and said to us, Well, this isn't how I think about my teaching. I need something else. So we had a more detailed kind of plan for them, which again is quite common. And when people go beyond the ABC storyboard to something more detailed, usually in Word, grid sort of thing, spreadsheets. But I think I mentioned the Visme tool, the infographic thing. One of my uh, interests was let's take the storyboard and then turn that into an infographic so that again we're explaining more clearly. Uh, to students. One of the things that comes up quite often is quite an interesting difficult question. Universities state on their websites, this is our approach to blended learning. And it's a very generic bland thing. It doesn't mean anything. And then of course, even within one institution, you have quite different approaches. We teach a wide variety of things from engineering, law, nursing, etc. So the approach to blended learning is very different if you're going out to for placement. So I think there's something around um, not just relying on blanket institutional statements about how blended learning is and, and being able and also the module specs not really user friendly students often don't even look at them read them so i think there's something about taking the storyboard and displaying it within moodle uh, in some sort of uh, more graphical format there's no tool in moodle that allows you to do that possibly h5p which I kind of a big fan of seeing with h5p and i did look at that as well but actually this is much more suited to kind of blocks of information. It's a really good sort of 40, 50 quid a year to give you an educational license, edit in the browser, plug it into your Moodle, update in Visme, changes obviously wherever it is. So there's something around being clearer to students. Uh, I noticed as well, if you look at the Open University, the way they do things, one of the key things within their uh, programs and modules, understandably as they're fully online, is a planner. They're really explicit about saying to students, here's what you're expected to do. And we hear this a lot from people that they don't have the time or they're not quite sure what's the best way of doing this. Uh, so one of the things we're going to push with the Moodle checklist beyond the kind of basic things is the idea of um, weekly instructions. It doesn't have to be a video, um, but just it could just be text, whatever format works. It's been a lot clearer explaining how they're going to be learning, what they should do. I would think I'll 
add a little bit to that as well. I would think um, there's probably, if you go through on a week by week basis, there may be a little bit too much detail for students. But generally, they don't really have much in the way of a, a map through their modules, through their programs. Um, quite often, one of the things that we discovered in doing this as well, academics will often tend to I mean, design is planning, arguably. Uh, academics will often tend to design in lists, whereas designers will design in grids. And this became quite a, a tension that we discovered. So if academics will typically design in lists, they'll prepare that for students in lists. Whereas in this more graphical format, it's a little bit easier to see sort of what fits where in, in our view. Um, there's a couple of points from Anora in the chat as well. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's the journey, isn't it? You're, you've got like a detailed part of the journey. It's like a week. Uh, yeah, we talked about learning journeys, but we're not really showing the learning yeah, journeys. It's, it's fair point. Now, I'm just going to pull a couple of Anora's points out from the chat. Um, would you want to extend this, i.e. the temporary works approach, uh, to more programmes? Um, and will you be offering activity or resource development as well to the rest of the learning design service? Well, I think I can, I think Anora, I can kind of bundle those together a little bit. As we said, temporary works was a lot of work for us, but we were in a position to be able to um, put the work in, shift away from the, you know, to get other people to do the rest of our day jobs and focus on this to make sure it worked, which was a, which was a great help. And the way that we've ended up framing it to, to the school a little bit, really, uh, hello there, Norm, um, uh, thing. Part of the way that we've sort of framed it as well is this is, this is effectively the gold standard. So uh, if, if uh, schools, programs are, they want the gold standards, then the, the cost of that to them is further investment in our team. Pay for a learning design contract. And they'll sit within our team and you'll get a good job. Now, you can do a storyboarding workshop. That's maybe the, the silver <laughs> standard. You get some, you know, an afternoon. Uh, co-design work with uh, learning technologists, students around the table, uh, subject matter experts as well, and you get much deeper planning and design work than you usually get. Um, however, you know, that's less cost to everybody, really. But I, ideally, uh, Anora as well, I mean, in some cases, we're also obviously, this makes our work more interesting, more engaging, fun as well. So ideally, we do want to be involved in sort of making some of those learning resources as well, that they often so rarely have the time to actually produce and develop themselves. But we've got the, you know, the knowledge to be able to do it. We just don't know the subject. Yeah, Dom, I'll just add one thing. Uh, Anora, I'll just add one thing as well, uh, which is the pushback which we've had. So I like the transparency earlier on, things haven't worked, fail, et cetera. Uh, the kind of pushback we've had from some people in the institution is this isn't going to scale, how are you going to sustain it? And to be fair, that's a totally legitimate question. So um, I really like the whole agile mentality. We're fortunate, I said to you that a number of years ago now, we are, uh, most of us went off and were given the Scrum Alliance agile training. So we're searched by Scrum Masters. And I always like thinking, but it hasn't really embedded in the institution these different things. But by that, I mean, if we've got finite digital education team resource, which we do. We've got X number of learning technologists, multimedia people, uh, learning design roles, people that do project management. We just we just have some sort of prioritization, large programs, programs where NSS is poor. Um, there is a filter, there is a way of saying, right, we're going to use the resource, you know, to use the agile phrase, well, what gives the most value? Well, obviously large programs, or if you've got programs that are you know, not doing so well for weather reason, through whatever triangulation of metrics, not just NSS, but, um, you know, there are ways to do this. And if it does work, and if it is helpful, if it is adding value, then maybe I'm just, again, too logical, simplistic and naive, then we might have to scale our own design team resource uh, with some universities. So if any of you haven't yet looked at Portsmouth's Enable, um, so it's really good. And they've got loan designs in every um, school. They're doing storyboarding. They've done 400 workshops in a year or 18 months. Really impressive. But there is a really tricky question, Anora, that we don't have fully the answer to. Anora, you can put the answer in the chat for us. 
Um, how will we then develop it? So you keep running it, but then you need to develop everything, which, as you said, there are a huge amount of time and resource, especially for this multimedia. Even just fixing these people's PowerPoints, doing the intro videos, it was as you know a lot of work. I didn't swear then, I did it's being recorded on YouTube, etc. Probably says fewer teeth than they started in two years. Yeah, ago. but so what? When when do do we get involved in the development? Like we can run the ABC workshops, and then what we're going to say to really time pressure program team? Well, off you go and develop that in Moodle now. It's going to be difficult. Some teams could do it, but I don't think many teams could. So it's about using our resource wisely and really thinking through how much multimedia. So there's question earlier about video versus static media. So just, you know, thinking, going back to learning outcomes and just being rationalizing, prioritizing in agile kind of way, what has value, what can we drop, backlog it, if it's just too much resource. This, this kind of thinking, I think, is what we need. We do have to wrap things up. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you. Well, I think rather than having a break, we just need to power through. Um, because, yeah, like I said, we have a hard stop at uh, 45. <laughs> so. Right. I don't know how we arrived at this topic of letting technologists scurry apart. Um, we all, of us in this room and online as well, we, we've all arrived at this career by various routes, haven't we, really? We've all come at it in a variety of different ways. So, um, some initial thoughts. Um, the title says, How did I get to where I am now? Well, very good question. Um, who or what got you into learning technology? In my case, it was quite a while ago, as we'll see on the next slide. Previous careers, did we did any of us do anything before we were in learning technology roles? Um, and if so, what and has that Im impacted and had any residual benefit? Are we, uh, we could be recent appointees. We could have been around the block for years. Sorry, I was writing this late at night um, or even decades. Um, what does our job title say about what we do? Does it actually reflect really what we do? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And what, maybe what type of role do we have? Are we a kind of grassroots learning technologist? Are we a senior person, more management level? Um, and picking up on the, some of the things that have been mentioned earlier around the focus of your post, are you a strict learning technologist, uh, learning designer, academic developer, product owner? You know, any number of ways in which we could look at the kind of role in which we uh, occupy. And also, how has uh, what we do changed or evolved? And what, what are the reasons behind this? So these are some of the kind of background thoughts that I've had around, uh, around, around being a learning technologist. So my journey to where I am now, which is... You know, you've got to make use of the logo on the slide somehow, haven't you? <laughs> so <laughs> so my, my journey to Guildhall School of Music and Drama and uh, Giacomo, my immediate predecessor. Um, yeah, so I started as a lecturer, fine art and art history. Um, hmm, did that really help me in career in learning technology? Uh, well, I started doing some teaching, blended very basically, um, took over as a part-time learning technologist, then became a kind of classic um, VLE support learning tech person at University of Surrey for three years, moved into a bad academic development role at Birkbeck for a year. I'm now looking around the room thinking, yeah, where have I been, who are we? Um, so University of the Arts London, VLE coordinator, back to Blackboard kind of classic role there, JISC, um, Julian, former line manager. Yes, um, so higher education technology advisor, worked with a number of different universities around, around London, London colleges as well. Um, I'll skip over the, the dotted line for a second. Uh, but then, you know, LT services manager at St George's, head of service at two places, but one, one is maternity cover. That was a really good year to choose to be a maternity cover head of service, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> um, yeah, at a complex place as well, let's face it. Um, you know, big Russell Group University and all the rest of it. Um, so mix of private institution, more mainstream, higher ed. Um, yeah, seen a lot of different places, used a lot of different technologies, you, you know, worked with a lot of different disciplines, worked with a whole range of plethora of things. Um, somebody asked me what I do the other day, somebody who doesn't work in the, in the sector of even higher education at all, and they kind of listened for 10 minutes and they, they said, so what you basically do is you wrestle an octopus every day. <laughs> you know, whether it's the whether it's the technology, whether it's working with people, whether it's, you know, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, yeah. So learning technologist. Those two words. And yes, I still am the only learning technologist at the school for the minute. <laughs> Fighting that fight, making the business case for an assistant. Um, yes, if we can. Let's get there. Let's do it. Um, so, yeah. So it is where I am now the same as where I was back in 2000, 2003? If you look at what it says on the can, it is, right? But, nah, shake of head. I agree with you there. Um, so, yeah, we're using different tools, different technologies, working with different people, working with different sizes of institution. For the first time in my career throughout all of this path, I'm now the only first time I'm working by myself as, you know, okay, part of a wider library team of, of six, but uh, still the only learning technology to start school. Um, so, yeah, maybe I didn't end up there quite by accident because from there, one of the places I was working with was here. And I, you know, formed some professional links and contacts and Current line manager was one of the key links I had there. So follow the dotted line if you want to follow the dotted line. In which case, could I have negated those things? Well, I would have if you didn't get the job done. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we all have our own reasons for the, the, the choices and the paths we take. Um, and this was kind of originally thought of as being a framing for a, a wider discussion. So maybe because of time, we'll, we might pick this up at a future meeting. So, uh, you know, we might individually like to reflect on what got us to where we are now, what makes us stay in the wrong. Um, I was preparing to interview a you know, set of new colleagues, you know, set of people for a new role um, the following day. So final interview question. Where do you see yourself being in X years' time? Um, yeah, what do you what do you see yourself doing? What's personally important or professionally important to you? And I think um, having been through that kind of COVID, oh, um, you know, you know, <laughs> reflect on that, and you think, okay, you know. Yeah, you've got the possibility of being ahead of service, but is that necessarily the most important thing? You, you know, is the hierarchy of the thing the, the really crucial thing to you? Or is it actually, for me, those couple of years of being head of different areas was um, the time in my career when I've actually done the least hands-on work with, with learning tech? Because it was more strategic. Okay, I'm still just strategically minded in... If you look at my job description, it says, you know, you will be responsible for forming the learning tech strategy for the school, which is great because it's just me. I can do that. Um, but I still have to get my hands dirty with everything to do with Moodle and everything to do with rolling out, you know, Mentimeter or whatever it is we're going to be doing and da 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 da, da you know. So I'm actually in there getting my hands dirty every day, which I think is great for me. It's given me personally, I think, some more authenticity and credibility in terms of what I what I do. I don't just talk it, I walk it as well with them. Um, so when you changed role, what made you change? Um, 
that's if it just wasn't an end of contract. You know, um, do you, are we looking at things in terms of internal promotion or moving on elsewhere? Or, you know, how have you reacted to forced changes as well? Because uh, you know, we might have had, had those in our time. Um, and what, what would help you be tempted away to other places or even, indeed make you want to run from your current plan? And uh, I certainly don't want to run because I think one of the key things for me is I, I founded an institution which allies to some of my outside interests as well. So I, I write about music and I'm, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm in, invested in the discipline sets that I'm, I'm supporting day in, day out. So I think that's really quite a key thing. And I think in terms of engagement with kind of my audience, I can go in to a room of, um, you know, uh, you know, the opera making and uh, writing team and, and talk to them about their MA program and go, yeah, well, of, of course, you know, when you're, you know, working with, you know, a conductor, a stage designer, you know, um, with singers, you know, understand what those people do on stage because I, I've been around that kind of environment for a while and I, I, I know some of those people and I've got, you know, and all that stuff. It just helps them, as you were saying, the previous thing really, have them, you know, show you some uh, buy-in because they've, had, you know, they've got some um, understanding that you actually have something that you can give in return that is of value to them and understand where they're coming from as academics and um, students as well. Um, so yeah, how we, do we want to spend a, a few minutes or do we, we want We to... do have time for, if anybody's got any questions, I think it Please. should, Definitely yeah. be this should be something we'll pick up in another session and perhaps be a bit more interactive in the mm. future. It was more of a flavour. Well, I was, I was people and, wanted to do yeah. that really. And does anyone have any questions or have anything they want to perhaps contribute to the <coughs> well, that was just a, a sort of observation in terms of what you're saying. Can I miss these? These two out and on straight here, but yeah. some of it is to do with when an organisation is ready for you. Yes, as well. indeed. Um, it obviously helps if you're taking up a new, uh, a new, a new role where the organisation of sort of planned into you as a learning technology planned you into their future. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nothing online. Good. Good. Fantastic. That's exactly what I like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there, but cool. I think it's definitely Short something that in another session we're going to pick up. Yeah. Think about how we incorporate that into yeah. a wider thing. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to skip past the break, but it's over to Okay, um, hi everyone, I'm Julie Vos, I'm Head of Digital Education at City, and just when you thought you'd escaped generative AI, I'm here as a last minute entry to make sure that every event has generative AI. <laughs> so, yeah, that's me. Julie, just so you know, in the session this morning, there was a bit on generative AI, so if anyone's here, <laughs> the, the session that did generate a lot of questions. Good, good. Um, so this is the definition at City that we're using of generative AI. So it's a broad label used to describe any form of AI you could use to create new text, images, video, audio, code, or synthetic data. So basically, it's not your sort of little prompts in Word like, oh, would you like to write best wishes? It's a bit more than that. It's about creating documents and, and images for you. Uh, and we did a recent student survey, and the students sort of let us know about this interesting quote uh, from Charlie Brooker about AI. I don't know if anyone's come across this. So powerful tools, but it's like growing an extra limb overnight. Uh, we don't know how to use it. It's amazing, brilliant, but we keep clumsily knocking things over. So I thought that was quite a nice analogy of AI. And I think everyone's sort of panicking. If you did grow an extra limb, you'd be running around going, ah! <laughs> um, which seems to be sort of the situation with AI. So thinking about what some of, some of the main staff perspectives that have been coming out at City and probably in your own institutions, First and foremost was that, how do I maintain the integrity of assessments with all the news about uh, students can now use it to submit assessments and they're going to be scored quite highly. 
Um, so, so based on that, how can I redesign my assessments? How will I know if students use generative AI linked to things like Turnitin's AI detection tools? But also we've got some staff saying, well, how can I support students to use it effectively? There's an acknowledgement in a number of fields. This is going to be tool that students use. In law, it's already used in um, developing legal cases. In sort of marketing journalism, it's already used there. And Cities being you know, is an institution for business practice and the profession. So our students go straight into industry. They need to know how to use these tools. Uh, staff also want to know how others are using generative AI. And I think there was a recent 101 case studies on using generative AI, which is very useful. Um, but also, like I said, how, how it's being used in industry. A lot of our staff haven't worked in industry for quite a while, so they're not up to date on how AI is being used. So how can we bring in industry leaders to talk about the skills that students will need to know? And I think there's a growing realisation that critical thinking skills are going to become more and more important. So student perspectives, we did a survey of students. Um, it got over 9,000 responses. I think AI got hold of it. Um, I think yeah. there's probably only about sort of 300, 400 real students, the rest are AI generated. But yeah, that was a bit of a shock waking up and finding 9,000 responses. Um, but the students are like, it's just another tool. It's like Google, it's like a calculator, it's there. They're not overly phased by it. Um, they are concerned that other students are gonna have an unfair advantage that you know, some are using these tools and others are you know, very dedicated and going, I'm not using this tool. I know it's there, I know I can use it and I'll use it in this part of my life, but I'm not gonna use it for assessments. They do want to know what they are, um, can use generative AI for. So they do want guidance from us about that. Um, but they also know it's very beneficial for neurodiverse students. So just seeing that blank page and getting that helping hand from ChatGPT or Bard about how to get started on an assessment. Uh, they want to be taught how to use it ethically and responsibly. They know they will need to use it in the workplace, so they want it embedded into what they do so they can develop those skills. So how is City responding? Um, so there's different approaches, and I was going to do a poll um, to find out how you're all using it. Um, but our approach is embracing it. I know other institutions have looked at it to say, oh, no, we're going to ban this. And others have said, no, we're just going to use detection tools. We're going to try and outrun it. But for us, it's about embracing it. It's going, it's there, it's going to be used, everyone's already using it, so how can we embrace this? So we've set up a task and finish group, it's got five subgroups, and we report into our digital board, which is a new board for the city. Um, we've got a vice president for digital and student experience, who works very closely with our VP um, education. And so we've got a digital board which oversees all things digital, it's going to be overseeing our digital transformation work. Uh, so I'm one of the co-chairs of this generative AI task and finish group. We were originally tasked for six months uh, back in sort of April time. I think it's going to go on a bit longer than that. Um, and co-chair is Simon Haley from our business school. Um, we have five subgroups. So one looks at what we're calling staff stuff, which is how can staff think about that? their assessments, how can they think about embracing AI into their teaching, but also what guidance do we need to provide to staff, um, things like awareness raising workshops. We have one which is the students group, um, and that's looking at how we can support our students, what guidance do they need, what are their views on it, um, how can we support them to use it effectively and responsibly. Then of course we've got the academic integrity side of things, so how does it tie into policies, like academic misconduct, academic integrity, um, and working with um, our quality department on that uh, and looking at what we need to update the guidance. We're not expecting a rapid change to our policy, um, but we are expecting some smaller changes. By and large, our policy covers this. Um, and I think there was a nice example from Bath where when they describe collusion, it's with someone or something else. And I thought that was just a nice tweak there. Um, infrastructure is the other thing we're looking at in terms of AI detection tools, but also what AI tools are we providing? So we know the co-pilot's coming in Microsoft. We've talked about, should we be getting chat GPT licenses for lecturers? What should we be providing for students? But also all the other side of things. Do we need to update other policies, things like data protection? About what guidance do we need to give staff and students about what data they put into these systems? And then finally, a new one we formed was around research. Um, it hasn't been something that a lot of people have been looking at, but we were looking at sort of research integrity, how you can use AI to write research grants, how you can get it to do literature reviews. So how does this impact on the research side of things as well? Right, uh, my first poll, 
which I'll just activate, is just to see how many of you have actually got a group in your institution that's looking at this. I'll just activate that. So for those on Zoom, it's just pollev.com slash Julie Vos. You can go into a web browser and hopefully you can all load that up. That working for everyone? We will fit it. That's fine. I can't see any responses coming through just yet. Mine is. I've tapped mine, but I don't know which DX. It's kind of recorded. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can see some responses here. It's just not showing on the main screen for me. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, so 69%, 71% have got yes, a couple of no's, and uh, some don't know. So most people have got some sort of group looking at that. That's good. Okay, I'll move on to the next slide. So what are we focusing on at City? So as I mentioned, a lot of it is about promoting this better understanding of AI. I think there's a lot of scaremongering out there, uh, especially with all the reports in the media. So it's just raising awareness that, you know, it isn't this big, scary beast. It is something that you know, we can sort of control in some sort of way, in some way, because, you know, it's about how can we be responsible in using it, at this effective use of the tools. As I said, updating our policy and other regulations and just keeping them under review because it's a changing situation. Uh, and I think the challenge we've got in higher education is committees only meet at certain times and you have to do, go through all these committees in order to get something processed. And then by the time you've done that, there'll be another update, there'll be something else coming along. So it's trying to be a bit more agile about how we do this. Um, but thinking about these implications for teaching and assessment, I think everyone's focused on assessment, but it's bringing it back and going, well, how can we embrace AI in our teaching as well? Uh, and what we don't want is everyone suddenly rushing to go, oh, right, okay, all our assessments are going to be put something into chat GPT and then critique it. Again, it's giving guidance on how you can best use it and tying it back to what um, students will need to do when they go into industry. Um, and then thinking about when and how generative AI can be used by students and staff as a support tool. And it's interesting, some of the narrative has been around, oh, well, students, they can't possibly use it to structure their essay and they can't use it to generate some you know, sample text. But staff, oh no, we, it's all right for us. We, we can generate lesson plans. We can get it to write our MCQs for us. This is amazing. So how do you manage that, that narrative between staff can do some things, but students can't? Um, so another poll here was just trying to get a feel for everyone's institutional res response. So are you prohibiting it? So no AI allowed. Are you trying to outrun it? So you're adapting your current practices to make it more difficult to use generative AI? Uh, or are you embracing it? Or do you not know? Uh, maybe in this, there we go. So it might activate through as I'm navigating through. Them. No one's prohibiting it so far. That's that's a good sign. So quite a few don't knows, 40% embrace, uh, 13 others. What other approaches have people got? Anyone in the room? Kind of an interesting. Um, so students aren't allowed to use AI by default, mm -hmm. but teachers can build it in if it's perfect. Yeah. I think that's the approach we're probably looking at. Or, you know, or they were saying we're embracing it. Actually, there will be times when it's like, if you've not been told you can use AI, then the default position is you're not allowed to use it. But if you have been told you can use it, then you really need to make sure it's clear how you are citing it. it you know, are you acknowledging it in some way? Do you have to provide the prompts? How much information do you give, have to give the lecturer? 
Okay. Um, so what have we done so far? So we've created initial guidance for staff and students and we're adapting that as, as things change. We have re reviewed our policies around academic integrity and misconduct. Uh, we opted out of Turnitin's AI detection functionality. I think most people did, but there were some who didn't. And it's been great to see um, how they've been testing it out. And I think there's a session uh, next week where we can sort of get together with other institutions to see what, what their experiences have been. Uh, we are looking at switching it on within a sort of um, sub-tenancy on Turnitin and, and testing it out there. Uh, we have run a couple of workshops with staff about generative AI. Um, they've generally been very positive, um, but they do want more information, more case studies about how it can be used um, and a lot more support. Uh, as I said, we've conducted some surveys. So we asked some student views on generative AI um, and some interesting themes coming out there, uh, as I've mentioned. Uh, we also asked the academic integrity officers their experiences of AI use and assessment. So there have been some cases where um, suspected use of AI has been found and it's how do they work through that? You know, when, especially when you don't have a detection tool, I think staff are used to having turn it in from the plagiarism side. And I think they're, they're, they do want something that gives them an indication, but I think it's get, getting across that understanding that this isn't foolproof. It's not like with plagiarism, there isn't a source you can necessarily point to and say it's definitely being copied from here. Um, as I said, we've discussed the role of AI in research. And we've just gone to so many events about generative AI. Every, every week, there's at least five or six, I just can't keep up. <laughs> uh, so this is what we're, we're currently sort of wrangling with is what we're calling the spectrum of AI uses from acceptable to unacceptable. So spell check, what do we think? That, that okay? Mm -hmm. Grammar check. Yeah. yeah. Enhanced search. Yes. Yeah. Assisted writing, correcting your style and tone is that okay maybe something like quill bot paraphrasing yeah yeah summarizing or interrogating unread sources <laughs> that's used as uh, an assistant mm. so is that okay yeah yeah great generating a first draft yet yeah, yeah. <laughs> an uncritical copying of ai output no, no. so i think yeah we, we got right okay this is not fine <laughs> This is fine. Yeah. This bit, it depends. <laughs> and the, this is the problem. The students want to know exactly what they can and can't do. Um, so yeah, hopefully as a sector, we can agree. Because I think that's the other challenge, is if we're not doing this as a sector, some students will go, yeah, but I'm allowed to do this in my institution. Well, it's not fair. I'm not allowed to. Um, so just a final poll, just to find out what you're all doing. So this is just free text. So yeah, what has your institution been doing? Anything new? I heard one institution was creating a code of conduct with students around how they can use AI. I thought that was a really nice idea I might steal. Okay, so lots of responses coming through. So many committees, yes, I seem to be bounced between different committees at one point because uh, Digital Board want to discuss it, and then our Education Employability Board want to discuss it, then we get taken to Education Quality Committee, then you go back to the other one, and they all want to know something about what's going yeah. on. Um, other people have been doing focus groups for students, guidance for staff and students. Yeah, forming working groups, waiting to see what others do. I think that's the thing we're all sort of waiting to see. And the Russell Group have come out with their sort of statement of principles around AI, which was fairly common sense, I thought. I don't know if those of you in Russell Group institutions. And um, decentralizing the response. Yeah, that's something we've 
sort of, you know, wrangled with is that how much can come from the centre and how much actually needs to be devolved down to individual module leaders um, and around some of the guidance that, you know, we were talking about, should we have a sort of an options board for lecturers? So option one is no use of AI down to full use of AI. And then you know, at least for the students, there's clear guidance for each level rather than each lecturer having to come up with their own text around hey, how AI can be used in their assessment. Um, some people are doing staff development sessions, high level academic integrity statement. Yeah, so a lot of people have put in place these statements about how AI can be used. They're talking to staff, making them aware comment that there are some who haven't seen chat GPT in the wild yet. A lot of staff haven't had a chance to play with it. But also we found that about a third of students had never used this sort of tool or had said in the survey, which was fully anonymous, that they hadn't used this sort of tool. So I think there's a lot of people who haven't really paid much attention to it. So Julie, can I just ask, we have to, you academics ask me can they get access to it? Can we have a site license? Mm -hmm. We're aware that they can physically go and create an account. Yeah. yeah, we've had staff asking, can we get a site license? I know other institutions have been asking that, but apparently it, that won't happen. It will just have to be embedded into other tools, but staff want access to the paid for version so that they know what students are getting access to if they are choosing to pay. Okay, so it seems like lots and lots of activity happening in, in our institutions. So just wanted to put a couple of useful links. We've got our student guidance is openly available. Our staff guidance is on SharePoint, so we can't share that. Um, I found the Monash guidance really, really useful in the early days. So do have a look at that if you haven't. Uh, and this was a video recommended about um, chat GPT for teachers. So just has some examples of putting assessments in, which is something some of our staff have done. They've gone through and put all their assessments through to see what sort of output comes out. And if you haven't come across it, the GIST National Centre for AI, um, they have regular updates on their blog. They've been doing some focus groups for students, so definitely have a look at that one. And that's it from me. Thank you. Any questions in the room? That's what we're going through a mic. Questions, comments in the room? I've got one about the general sector. Everybody's uh, committing a lot of resources. I think somebody mentioned in one of the kind of forms of feedback. Could we not have some way of kind of contributing to this a collective resource? Mm. More contributing and basically having a one stop shop for guidance rather than doing this individual. Yes. As a sector, we've got our Yeah, it would make sense. The National Center could do that. And I, I think I read um, Open University going to be putting a, a, get this, a, a learning package which is something we've talked about. And it's like, well, maybe we could just team up with the OU and then there'll be something on Open Learn that everyone can use to support their students. Because I think, you know, there has been talk of, could we have a module where it talks about, you know, what is AI, these are the ethics, responsible use, and then it breaks down into sort of the different disciplines. This is how it's used in these different disciplines. And that could be a module that goes across the institution, for example. Trying to get that through all the program approval would be very tricky if you wanted to embed it in. But yeah, you know, we need to be thinking about the guidance we give to students. So I think, um, some of our staff are looking at producing a small like sort of lecture series that staff can then embed into the teaching. I did say maybe it should be done on TikTok because we have found that incoming students are using TikTok a lot more for learning than I guess our current students are. Uh, that didn't, didn't go down too well. I think, you know, lecturers prefer the sort of standard lecture style rather than a very short mm -hmm. TikTok video. But maybe we can do a bit of both students teaching other students about generative AI. Um, but you're right, I think it should be as a sector, and we should agree all the different approaches so we haven't got that sort of, in this institution, this is the approach, and in this institution, it's very different. AI-generated TikToks. Yeah, there you go. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Funnily enough, we now have a little bit more time. So <laughs> if there was any questions that anybody had um, that they really wanted to ask any of our speakers today, um, the floor is yours. So I know you had a question, but I don't know if it's past I, that time now. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, if there's nothing on the chat, yeah, then I, I think to I think we wrap up then. Um, well, but yeah, thank, thank you for everybody online and thank you for everybody for attending. It's lovely to see you all. And um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. Oh, Julie. Can I just say thanks to Amy. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah.
team that helped out um, with putting the event together. I think it's been a really good event. Yeah. Um, if anyone else would like to host the event, we will be looking for a host. The autumn meeting is normally so no, November time. Um, you don't have to provide lunch, but it is always welcome. Um, so yeah, just let us know if you're able to host. Uh, okay. so, so today, as the first time we come, we're hosting monthly and then 25 on the same day. How do you feel about that? <laughs> It's quite intense if you're the host. <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't have any money, unfortunately. <laughs> but I have got cheaper than the host. Queen Mary, my director, so I'll be in touch with you. And just a final thanks as well to um, Jason and Evan as well, because they did help me put um, some of this together. So, and, and Jason helped with the tables this morning, lifting and shifting. So, uh, yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to uh, close the uh, the chat now and everything. So, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.